Uh, what I'd like to start off with here is one of our small batch bourbons, and this is going to be our Basil Hayden bourbon. Uh, Basil Hayden is 80 proof. It's a non-age stated bourbon, but we're going to age these whiskey barrels for probably about six years, but we do use a range of ages. So age is not important as much as flavor is important. And Basil Hayden has a unique flavor profile for a couple of different reasons. Uh, one is it's got a very low proof distillate off the still, meaning that we don't strip more aroma and flavor out of that distillate before it goes into the barrel for aging. Uh, we will age all the bourbons that we're trying today uh, in a new unused charred oak barrel, which is uh, par for the course when you're talking about the regulations of bourbon. Um, and if you want to round out what regulations are, just to kind of increase your knowledge base, to be a bourbon, you have to be made in America. You have to be aged in that new unused barrel that we just talked about. You have to be made of no less than 51% corn. We will try a rye when we talk about our Knob Creek rye. You have to be no less than 51% rye when you're making that, but the rest of the regulations stay consistent. Um, we cannot uh, distill the whiskey any higher than 160 proof. We can't go into a barrel any higher than 125 proof. We don't go into a bottle any lower than 80 proof. And then bourbon is a very genuine product, so is rye, meaning we cannot add or subtract any flavors or colors other than water before it's matured. So we will start with a very low proof distillate with our Basil Hayden. And we make that distillate from a mash bill that's very unique in the fact that we use twice the amount of rye. And that rye is going to give us a spicier bourbon mash bill. So we'll have a really nice balance of sweet and spicy. And uh, for me, when I talk about Basil Hayden, I say that it is a full flavored, light bodied uh, bourbon with an elegant spice. And the best way to appreciate just the overall flavor of this bourbon, and go ahead and pour yourself a little taste uh, with me here on the panel or uh, at home if you're following along. Um, what I like to do first is we eat with our eyes first, right? And we drink with our eyes first. So you always wanna look for the color uh, of the whiskey. Basil Hayden at 80 proof in the bottle is gonna be a nice kind of golden straw color. And then when we nose the whiskey, a lot of folks kind of just wanna put their nose right into the glass. And you know, you might be able to get away with that with an 80 proof bourbon, but as we get a little higher, closer to the 100 proof of the Knob Creek, if all you do is do that with a closed mouth, you're gonna hork up a snooter full of alcohol, you're gonna anesthetize your taste buds, and you don't wanna do that because we have so many great things for you to drink and taste today. So the best way to, to avoid that whole mistake is to set the glass under your nose, part your lips, and breathe in. And just sort of give it a quick little inhalation. That's gonna allow the, the alcohol vapor or the ethanol to kind of go out into the atmosphere. And what you're left with, because you've given that ethanol room, is now you have the aroma of the bourbon or the rye. And so what we're getting here is some of those vanilla and caramel notes, but they're not really predominant or overpowering like they might be in a more traditional bourbon. Instead, what we have is a good balance of that vanilla and caramel and a little bit of oak, but we also have spice and that's gonna come from that extra shot of rye. The rye is gonna give you a little bit of spice. The corn of bourbon is gonna give you a little bit of that sweet nuttiness. And then you're gonna get a lot of those complex flavors from the uh, aging and oak. Some of that, you know, the vanillas and caramels, the fruit notes, things like that. So. Uh, let's go ahead and nose that, and we see that spice coming through. It's nice and complex, but also light. And then when we give it a taste, the way that I like to taste whiskey is to let it sit on my tongue for a moment. And after a beat or two, I, I give it a good old what we call the Kentucky chew. I chew on that bourbon. And then after I've gotten it all over my palate, and I know I've got it, uh, I'm receiving the flavor as, as, as fully as I can, then I go ahead and swallow it or expirate it, and then I'll smack my lips, bringing air across my tongue, which will activate my taste buds and help me to appreciate uh, the finish of the whiskey. So is it quick and clean on the finish? Is it long and mouthwatering? We're gonna go the gambit. And so one of the great things, of it, but they're all gonna make your mouth water a little bit, which is really good when you're pairing because it makes you want to have a little nosh, have a little taste, have a little nosh, have a little taste and sip all the way to, to, the, to your end point. So let's go ahead and taste a little Basil Hayden together and let's see what we think. Iciness up front, some of that peppermint really shines. Uh, one of the reasons why I chose this pairing to start us off is because I think that this is gonna go very well with some of the, the softer subtle notes because this bourbon isn't gonna be overpowering. Uh, starting at 80 proof, we're able to really appreciate the, uh, the subtleties of the cheese we're pairing with and the charcuterie that we're pa pairing with or the salumi that we're pairing it with. And uh, we have an opportunity to really start playing with big flavors, balancing other more robust flavors from its uh, uh, 
counterparts and the pairings as we go down through these lineups. But I wanted to start nice and light. It's always a good place to start just so we can kind of build our palette and start to really sort of uh, accustom ourselves to what we're up to today, which is just nothing but delicious fun. So I won't talk that long for everything. I just wanted to set the table for uh, what makes bourbon bourbon, how to taste the bourbon, give you a few tasting notes, Basil Hayden, as you might be uh, experiencing it right now, full flavor, light body, elegant spice, and a medium clean finish. And that's going to pair really well with uh, what Ryan and Zoe, or, or Zoe and then Ryan have selected as the, uh, the counterpart pairings for this. So hope you guys enjoy. And I guess I'll kick it to Zoe. Yeah, let's. Uh, that, that was that was fabulous. I really appreciate the in-depth knowledge on that, and uh, it was uh, uh, it is a fabulous uh, bourbon. So let's go to Zoe and have uh, Zoe. You know, Zoe is an American Cheese Society certified sensory evaluator. So when we talk about that, is you know you don't know what that is. If you watch the previous video with Zoe, she talks all about it, but. She can explain some of the nuances that we're going to get in some of the cheeses. So when we build this together at the end, you'll be able to put all these pieces together. So Zoe, tell us about the Highlander. Okay. I such I so appreciated Adam's um, setup on how to evaluate fine spirits from a sensory analysis perspective. So just like Michael said, I spent a lot of time evaluating cheese professionally, but I love those glimpses into the parallel universe. And I'm of course more used to a wine or a beer where you get your nose in the glass and you get as much into your nose as you can. And the open mouth trick and the, and the Kentucky chew was like, I'm gonna, that's gonna stick with me forever. Good. I've always uh, really enjoyed carrots, but I, um, gosh, I don't think I've done a cheese pairing with them for a long time. So I'm really looking forward to this as a, as my favorite sport is pairing cheese with other things. So I, <laughs> I've got a, a wedge of Highlander here and I'll kind of walk you through in a similar way how I would approach this. Um, so this is my wedge of Highlander here. This is what I would call a semi-firm cheese. So it's not hard and crumbly like Parmigiano Reggiano. It's of course not as soft as as a brie and this is um, you know kind of a sliding scale. I'm noticing that there's some openness here. So these little little eyes, that's typical in Alpine style cheeses. A lot of times you get the nice big round Swiss eyes. Um, these are more typical for a tome style and, uh, and especially a raw milk cheese. There's a little bit more like liveliness and activity. So this is a raw milk cheese. Another thing I noticed about it besides the nice orange kind of like rosy rind that tells me it's a wash drying cheese so while this cheese is ripening we're actively washing it with a saltwater brine and that's cultivating a community of microbes that is uh, not only sort of protecting the cheese and slowing down the drying so we're not cracking and drying the cheese out it has a nice supple texture but it's also all of those varied microbes that we're cultivating on the rind are contributing enzymes those enzymes are breaking down the fats and proteins in the cheese and making complex flavor. So it's, when this cheese is very young, just a few days old, it tastes like sort of like feta. It's like salty, bland, not much going on. And then over time, those aromas get opened up by the enzymes coming in from the microbes as the fats and proteins are broken down into small enough pieces to get into your nose. That's literally what cheese aroma is. It's the, the microbial activity has broken down your, your solids to the point that they become aromatic, aromatized. Another visual clue about this cheese is how bendy it is, right? So this is a very elastic textured cheese as opposed to snapping. I can give it a little bend and it kind of goes back into place. So that tells me that this is a lower acid cheese. Um, the other end of the spectrum would be maybe a cheddar that if you, you know, made a little, sometimes you can't even get a clean slice because it crumbles right off your knife. And the longer the cheese make, the more lactose, milk sugar, gets turned into lactic acid, and uh, the more crumbly your texture gets. That's because calcium, everybody knows milk has a lot of calcium. Calcium is the glue that holds cheese texture together, milk proteins, and the more acid you make, the more you dissolve away that glue. So a shorter make, like this mountain style cheese we say, Highlander, um, uh, shorter make, less acid production, nice bendy texture, because there's a lot of that calcium left in here. There so this is the only one. <laughs> own one, Highlander, <laughs> yeah. right? We live in what's called the Highlands of Vermont. And so there's like the local, the only little inn in town is called the Highland Lodge. The little art center is called the Highland Center for the Arts. There's a road called Highlander Road. And so 
not only is it a sweet 1980s, 90s pop culture reference, but it is a, a, <laughs> a cultural thing around here. Um, and it refers to the highlands where this type of cheese was historically made. So they're making cheese on a mountainside in copper kettles. They wanted to get milk in and out of those vats, like taped to the side of the, the Alps as they could down in the lowlands where it would be easier to make cheese or growing crops. So they kick the cows out, they go up into the mountains. You can eat the grasses where we can't farm. And uh, so they were literally like making cheese while camping. So they'd make one big wheel of cheese in a big copper cauldron. And the fastest way to do it was to build a fire under the cauldron, cook the curd. And that helps dry it down. Uh, building acidity is another way to dry your curd down, but you'd need more time and space to do that kind of work. So cooked curd cheeses have um, a characteristic dense, sort of elastic texture, and then some of those cooked milk and cheese flavors. So scalded milk, caramelized notes, cured meat is a, is a note that we get out of here, and then definitely roasted nuts. And in, in the case of Highlander, which is half raw cow's milk and half raw goat's milk from our new goat farm, I get really interesting gamey earthy notes that come across to me like roasted chestnuts, uh, maybe a little buckwheat honey. Um, goat, goats give a nice interesting animally aroma and cow's milk lends a richer body. Goat's milk is naturally very lean. It's hard to get this texture from pure goat's milk. So it's sort of a best of both worlds cheese. So I've looked at it. I've talked a lot about it. I've smelled it, definitely get those mm, uh, grassy, nutty notes, meat, goat. The texture on the palate, really velvety, smooth and soft. It really doesn't take much to bite through it. Really gets creamy on the palate. As you clear your palate, you pay attention to the finish, just like Adam was talking about. This really has a long lingering finish, some caramelized notes and roasted chestnuts for me. Sometimes it comes across as like peanut butter. So um, Adam, I'm curious. That was awesome. Like that was a great note with honey and I think the chestnuts too and the, the earthiness of what you're talking about there. And, and I haven't really had a chance to try a lot of hybrid cheeses between or raw cheeses at least between and this is really cool with the cow and goat cheese or milk. Um, yeah, and I think it speaks well to the, the a lot of the notes that I'll describe with Basil Hayden is, uh, you know, floral, herbaceous, grassy sort of notes that come through because of the higher rye content. And I think that it works really well with this cheese because of how earthy the cheese is, but also it's very, it's, it's got some dynamic quality to it too. But then also, I think it, they complement each other really well. Some of the things that I've paired, some of the ideas for pairings later, might be a little bit more playing off of some of the, the differences, but I think these the, the harmony here is really nice. I think so too, just to the aromas of both are mingling mm -hmm. in a very interesting way. Do you, when you're pairing with spirits, do you ever add water or do you tend to go straight up? Um, I think adding water is a great thing to do um, as you explore the whiskey. I think that when you're coming at the first pass, uh, trying it at bottle strength the way that the producer intends. And, and I'm talking about whiskeys from all over the world, not just what we do. But I think it's a great way to kind of appreciate the intent of the flavor. But then adding water is the best way to open up that whiskey. This whiskey can sit in the glass for as long as we chat and it's not going to change. And really the aroma might soften a little bit, but the, the flavor is never going to change. The flavor profile won't, won't change from moment to moment. So uh, adding water is the best way to kind of get deeper and into the more subtle notes. Um, I would say that eight proof with Basil Hayden, you don't really have to add any water if you don't want to, but as we start to climb the mountain and proof, adding water is, is a pretty good, pretty good thing to keep handy, especially when we're talking about, you know, more delicate and nuanced pairings like what we're working with today. Mm -hmm. Having to return to the pairing multiple times. Yeah. It's a, yeah. Yeah. All right. Great. All right. Ryan, tell us about the charcuterie you chose. You got it. So I'll walk you through the selection, a, a little bit of information about the, the prosciutto itself, and then also kind of the pairing suggestions to go along with the two components here. So what I selected to pair with the Basil Hayden and the Highlander was our prosciutto. So prosciutto Cremonelli is a domestic prosciutto. This is heritage breed pork coming from the United States, um, her both heritage breed and certified humanely raised pork. So this is a beautiful, high quality cut of pork 
This is literally just meat, salt, and hung to dry. So this is as as uh, delicate and as um, basic in terms of flavor profile that you can get, which is really popular with, with the most sophisticated of palates. Usually prosciutto is king at the dinner party. And that's really why I chose the pairing for this cheese and this, this um, bourbon pairing, because you've got so much in the basil Hayden that is smooth and light. You've got so much in the Highlander that's coming out. And I really wanted something that really complemented those two selections and didn't, you know, overpower or draw away flavors. So I wanted something that would pair right in nicely and enhance the flavors of both of those components coming into this pairing. So what you have in prosciutto is that heritage breed domestic pork leg that is salted and hung to dry. Uh, based on the heritage breed that we use, which is a Duroc Berkshire cross, you're going to get roughly a 10 to 12 pound leg, um, and that will age for 10 to 12 months. Typically, prosciutto aging is dictated by the size of the leg. So if you're using a larger breed or you're using an import leg, which is going to be significantly larger than what we have domestically, you're going to see a significantly longer finish for that salt to penetrate all the way through. Um, but in a Duroc Berkshire cross, in a domestic pig, you're going to see approximately a 10-month aging cycle to a 12-month aging cycle based on the overall weight of the leg that goes into aging. So this is something that you're going to take out of the fridge, you're going to put on a board, you're going to let come up to room temperature for about 20 to 30 minutes, and then you're going to either wrap it in cheese or you're going to pair it on the side of the cheese. You can use a, a chutney, a cracker if you'd like, um, but really my favorite way is to take something like Highlander, kind of make yourself a little sandwich, roll it around, put it in your mouth together, and then slowly let it melt in and dissolve. That kind of buttery smoothness of the prosciutto is going to pair in with the flavors coming out of the cheese. And then you've got a really nice kind of wash down with Basil Hayden for a complete pairing with a lot of flavor. That's a very smooth entryway into this uh, meat, cheese, and uh, bourbon pairing day. It's really amazing how much of the saltiness is uh, absorbed into the cheese and into the bourbon. Uh, you know, when you taste it, you can taste that saltiness, but that's the first thing that disappears. And I think it's really cool that, uh, you know, that it's there, but, uh, and it brings out some more of the flavors. I wonder why, why uh, maybe Ryan, you can say, talk about this, but I, I've noticed that when I have the chance to have very nice charcuterie and salumi around that when you taste, and I know that you're supposed to let it rest and, and come to room temperature and things, but when you when you try it cold, if you're just that ravenous, right? You gotta, you gotta have a snack or something and you try it, like you get, you get a lot of salt, right? Like salt seems to be kind of the overpowering flavor, but then as you kind of let the, the fat soften and everything like that, the, the flavor is so much more subtle. I mean, it's still very, it, you still get salt, don't get me wrong, obviously, but you know, it's just so much more complex. I, I know why that happens in bourbon, you know, like we were talking about just a minute ago with Zoe and adding some water and letting the complexities come out. What's, what's the process like behind that for, for charcuterie, et cetera? That's a very good question. And it speaks to specifically all types of salumi, not just prosciutto, but when you've got a cold product, a lot of what you, you've you built into that flavor and that that very delicate build of the, the lactose breaking down the sugar uh, or the, those, the bacteria breaking down the sugar and creating lactic acid, which is then gonna develop the flavor. A lot of those nuances are kind of stored dormant while you've got a really cold refrigerated product. And so if you choose to reach right into the fridge, grab a snack and throw it down, that complex of flavor development, specifically in um, added flavor elements like a calabrese, which is in, uh, inspired by the Calabrian region, paprika, pepper, those kind of like bolder, robust flavors, you really don't do yourself any justice because you're not going to get those flavors. They're kept dormant um, by that colder temperature. And if you let them come up to room temperature, you're going to get the full complexity of flavor suite in that particular product. So definitely always best to wait for room temperature if you can. Makes a big difference. All right. So Zoe, what's your impression of the three together? Well, I'm gonna echo Ryan's adjective of smooth here. I think all, the, all of them come together with such softness on the palate considering how aromatic each element is. And I suppose this might be one of the more delicate um, bourbons that we're going to have. 
uh, but it's still intense when compared to a cheese, you know, it really, uh, it's a big impact on your palate, but altogether, I thought that the intensities match surprisingly well, which uh, was a surprise to me. The, the cheese and the bourbon together first were, um, they sort of, um, they met each other nicely and I, I noticed more like vanilla notes and also that rye spice. I picked up a little bit more of it than I had noticed before um, from the Basil Hayden and then layering in the prosciutto, which is beautiful by the way. I mean, to have a pack like this open up and just have the ribbons just like pull apart. I mean, usually you're fighting with like yeah. a hard pack and like doing the peel and the, it's amazing how well preserved it is in that gas switch fleshed um, tray, well done. Anyway, um, but altogether, I think um, the meat, like I said, made it just a more buttery, smooth experience. And it brought up more floral notes for me uh, all around. So if we stopped here, I would say this was a very successful afternoon. <laughs> <laughs> Adam, your thoughts on the three? Yeah, you know, um, I, I'd like to echo all the, all the wonderful things Zoe and Ryan said. Um, but you know, when you make a whiskey, you start with a beer, you start with what we call a distiller's beer, right? And so there are certain mouthfeel notes that you can kind of bring over from that, from that beer element of the, the whiskey. And so if you were to kind of dumb down everything that were, that, that was in front of us for that pairing right there, it was almost like having the nicest ham and cheese sandwich being washed down by a beer that you could possibly have, right? <laughs> Next level. <laughs> yeah, it's level, that's for sure. So good, though. so delicious, all of it. Ryan, your thoughts? So this was probably one of the um, one of the easiest pairing suggestions after going through the bourbon selections, after eating a, a little piece of cheese to try and, okay, what do we put with this? What flavor profiles are going to line up nicely? This was definitely one of the easiest ones to put together because in my mind, it was such a smooth blend of flavors coming in from Basil Hayden, coming in from Highlander and merging and kind of mashing up all together. Uh, I won't go as far as to say it was my very favorite because there's blue cheese in the mix and that's always my favorite but this one was very much uh, an easy pairing something that I would happily put out for guests um, and know that this is going to be a home run pairing for anybody who's going to taste it yeah definitely a crowd pleaser I would say no there's sure. nothing that is too anything it's all just works perfectly together and just really anybody can be happy with this I exactly. think so and I think your idea of adding a little bit of uh, water to it as we we're finishing through is an excellent idea that really kind of uh, softens it out. Zoe and I did chocolate a, a week ago, and uh, there was a, one thing where too much chocolate and not enough cheese would sometimes unbalance it. And this is a, another good example is that, uh, you know, having the right amount of sip with the right amount of cheese and the right amount of charcuterie, the prosciutto, uh, really helps out you know, because there is a balance to it and they all work really well together in, in I guess, uh, in, in the right amount of uh, volume. 